Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, happy new year, Mark. Happy new year. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Mark. So let, let me introduce you for this session. So today in the, in the Culture Cave um, discussion, really excited to have on the show, um, Mahak Jain, who is 29 years old, um, living in Rishikesh, um, yogi, of course, and uh, doing the masters in philosophy and studying Vedic culture in Shivananda, Shivananda, Shivananda Ashram yeah. and Swami Atmananda. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. that, Mark, about your experience studying there? Sure. So it's a, it's a very different experience what people have in Europe. Uh, so basically, the Vedic culture comes from India, and people have a different conception of what an ashram is or what uh, uh, what a temple is. So they they certainly get confused with it, and then they go to India, and for them they they just go to any ashram. A lot of things are considered uh, that any 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 hotel uh, they just name themselves as an as an ashram or just after the, the name of the hotel they put ashram after it and then they provide certain feelings of, of an ashram like uh, waking up early and providing sattvic food uh, and for them that's an ashram but if you actually go to an ashram uh, there are many where you go and then where you don't have to pay and uh, they don't really care about the money whether uh, just they want you to come and they will provide you a lot of education about uh, the ashram life that you have to wake mm -hmm. up really early in the morning and mm -hmm. then you you start with yoga or meditation and afterwards they provide you lectures regarding the vedic culture and then you have to participate in all the ashram activities along with helping in the kitchen or taking garden work or any kind of things what they are doing in the ashram uh, mm -hmm. In return, what you can provide them, either you can provide them a donation, uh, that's uh, that's up to you, whether you like it or not. Uh, if not, then you can just stay there as long as you want, or you can speak to the Swami. There are many Swamis or different Swamis who are living over there who will provide you the addition, and then you speak with them further. Mm -hmm. and that's how your life uh, uh, is going through in an, uh, in an original ashram. Right. So for anyone who's joining us today um, who isn't familiar with what Swami actually is, the definition of Swami is, is a person who has renounced everything and wants to uh, work towards the path of, of self-realization uh, where the material world no longer matters. And the Swami meditates and, and learns basically the Vedic history uh, by tradition more deeply to understand the meaning of life and is that is that the swami's meaning of life or is that the greater meaning of life so to what extent is that this the swami's um self kind of exploration existentialism and to, how does that connect to mm -hmm. the greater question of who we are Mark? Okay, uh, so when we talk about that your purpose of life or the greater purpose of life it's one and the same thing because once you understand what really makes you happy, then the world becomes happy to you. The, mm -hmm. the question comes when we try to understand what's your meaning of your life and what's my meaning of life, what's, what's the greater meaning of life. Everyone, uh, everyone will start asking this question when, when they get into spirituality and when they get into, uh, into philosophy. But see, if you try to understand yourself and if you make yourself better, if you try to make yourself happy, you started to see things uh, become, becoming happy for you and for, for other person as well, because then your mind turns more and more into positive things. The way you look at things, it becomes positive instead of uh, getting a negative thought inside you. So mm. this is the main change that, that comes into you when you try to understand the philosophy and the Vedic culture that will teach you that how to be positive. When you try to meditate to remove all the thoughts which is coming into your mind, that will lead to the future. Because now mostly stress comes from the past and from the future, not from the present. Because what you are doing right now, you can't really do that because you're either you're always thinking uh, about the past, what has already happened, or your, your thoughts coming from the future, that what, what's really going to happen. That will give you the stress. Once this part is removed, then you are only present right now. Then you can enjoy the things which is happening right in front of you and then what's right in front of you and what's in your hands. So mm -hmm. you can change everything what's right in front of you, but people can't really do that. So mm. uh, that's, that's really hard to understand and that's really uh, easy to say but it's really hard to do that when you when you actually apply that in your real life when you when you started doing things in a normal life and 
all the uh, all the problems started to come in your life it could be in in many forms so, so mm-hmm. when 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 it comes then the real questions start and then then they 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 need to understand that what's what's their purpose of life what's really important to them so mm-hmm. this is the challenging part that they have to do in their real life not just uh, while doing meditation but also uh living a normal life is a is a part of a meditation where they have to calm themselves down mm-hmm. so this so is te- this is the meaning of purpose of life yeah so you're teaching quite a number of people and and you're gaining experience every step of the way what have you found in terms of the past and the future that people that you've worked with and you've taught mm-hmm. struggle with the most when they give you feedback about meditations what do they struggle with mm-hmm. more the past or the future or or is it kind of in equal measure okay so mostly it's it's the past when it's i i can say it's both uh, past and the future because when they started to tell uh they get into the meditation it's because of their past because they they deal with something in their past and that's the reason they get into meditation because that mm-hmm. is haunting them and they can't keep themselves quiet and that's the reason they get into meditation but when they go further they started to realize that what what is the impact on their future because they want to have a future now okay the past has already haunted them but what's going to haunt them in the future so they they need to know that okay what's future what's the future for them and then the thoughts started to come them i won't say i can't say that it's a, it's a, the the past is less or the future is less they both are equally and that's the reason that they both are in a equal sharing pattern that is uh, that is holding you to to be in the present sometimes mm-hmm. it's the, it's any traumatic uh, uh, incident which has happened in the past that is haunting you and then uh, or sometimes you are worried about the future that's what's going to happen to you tomorrow that that won't let you sleep mhm mhm right so i so suppose this is the most things Mm, and I guess it depends on the circumstances as well. So obviously we're in the middle exactly. of a very, very serious um, epidemic and it's, it's so important that people more than ever now turn to meditation to be in the present moment, I suppose, because we're in such a time of uncertainty that we, we don't even know what the future holds. So would you agree that now one of the biggest problems with, with future projections in meditation and that worry is, is coming from fear and a place of the unknown? Mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. that's that's exactly true what you are saying that uh, mm-hmm. it's coming exactly from the future because we don't know what's going to happen next everyone is worried that uh, uh, how things will be uh, they they are depressed and they are stressed just being at home just working at home and they can't go outside especially it's more and more happening in europe mm-hmm. and the west world because they are putting more lockdown mm-hmm. and then people are just trapped inside i've also been into the same situation when in, uh, in in india we had a we had a lockdown for almost like 6 months and then we were going crazy and then i also had this feeling that i was going crazy because i i can't really go outside and then i always try to be positive but it was really hard to do that because every mm-hmm. morning i try to th- try to think that okay today i try to stay positive and then just let the the day go goes by mm-hmm. but by the end of the day i started to realize that it's it started getting more and more difficult so right. so i can understand that how people are managing in this kind of situation it's it's not an easy situation not, not for me and not for anyone else doesn't yeah. matter whether they have a family or not but just to stay inside at home to mm-hmm. can't be outside it's it's a really difficult situation for mm. for all over the world right now mm. let's talk about yoga because um transitioning on from that what what's really interesting mm-hmm. at the moment i think is that the kind of um the kind of mental cycle that people are going through i i think is that you know people want to go out we're all social creatures of the earth kind of thing but at the same mm-hmm. time we can't we can't socialize as much as we used to and it mm-hmm. i think it brings about this kind of hesitant thinking cycle would would you agree with that mhm um, yeah yeah that's that brings, that's totally true mhm and mm-hmm. that brings me on yeah, to yoga on. it brings me on to yoga because mm-hmm. I don't know about you Mac but in in my yoga practice it definitely one of the benefits that it gave me personally which was a kind of unexpected benefit when I deepened myself into mm-hmm. yoga years ago was was the decisiveness it helped mm-hmm. me to be more decisive calmer in my decisions mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. more certain of my decisions um mm-hmm. can you talk a little bit about any any kind of experiences like that that you may have had with yoga 
Okay, so uh, when when I talk about yoga and okay, so the yoga is different for the, for the Indian culture and the yoga might be different for the Western culture. For them, they they treat them as a part of a sports as well. But uh, that's that's also a good thing. At least they are doing something just instead of just sitting at home and not doing something. So it gives you a punctuality. That, that's the first thing that you at least you are doing some things, and it's not even yoga. if you do any kinds of sports even if you do running or just walking it gives you a ease of mind it just give you uh, a calmness that you feel happy afterwards because just by sitting at home uh, you started to go into a deeper state which which might give you a moody effects inside you or it gives you a mood change or it it gives you a negative uh, times but when you started doing something a sports and then uh your body started to work out itself and uh, your breathing get faster so then you, instead of thinking anything else you just control on your breathing because then you're just looking at your breath you're you're feeling your breath so while doing yoga you might have seen that when you hold the position mm-hmm. you're engaging your whole body and then your breath get faster so at that time you try to control on the breath you try to focus on the breath and try to make it calmer so these things will help you when you do that in your daily life it becomes a practice and when you when you start doing it in a in a daily routine it it gives you a mental effect for your daily life as well then you start uh, doing the same things uh, while working normally when mm-hmm. you speak to a person you started to feel that your breath getting getting faster when you when you get angry or when you when the ego started to kick in but mm-hmm. so this is this is the small small changes that you started to feel but obviously you can't just do that okay that if you do yoga once a week or maybe once a month and then you started to see the changes no it has to be on a daily basis i'm not doing that you have to do that one hour to the two hours a day maybe 10 minutes or 20 minutes can can be a good start and it's yoga is not about just doing the asanas you can also do just some pranayama so that will help you to relax the mind that will help you to relax the stress as well and then obviously you are just calming your breath in that and then you're working on your breath patterns mm-hmm. and then afterwards if you feel like just go on the meditation if not just pranayama is enough but if you want to to have a full picture mm-hmm. yeah generally we start with uh, with with the yoga and afterwards mm-hmm. uh, when our body is tired we try to calm our breath with pranayama and then afterwards we go to meditation because then our mind is tired and then it will it will think less about the thoughts and the future and the past mhm Mhm. Yeah, absolutely. Um the fire breath is is has been a, an interesting topic actually. So, um mm-hmm. can you first, first of all can you t- tell us a little bit about the breath of fire and and how it's how it's used in in yoga practices for anyone who isn't familiar with it? Okay, so it's like the burning uh heat inside you and it's going outside and taking all the heat which is inside you which is which has been generating all days because uh, you breathe normally but when you when you try to do fire breathing you're forcefully taking out this heat inside of your body and try to gain uh, try to take the positive energy and the fresh air inside you so it will help you to stay calm that's the first thing when when something is a lot of heat is, is inside you when it, it's going outside you you started to feel calm inside because this heat is making you uncomfortable Mm-hmm. it's just your body is too much get used to of it that you don't realize it that how much heat mm-hmm. you have inside your body but mm-hmm. when you take it out forcefully then then you started to feel more relaxed uh, people mm-hmm. don't really know sometimes when they started doing yoga mm-hmm. they uh, whether they like it or whether they don't like it it's uh, the mm-hmm. fire breathing is happening automatically because when we say mm-hmm. uh, for example when we say we do ashtanga yoga we do ujjayi breathing so it's 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 too in intense sometimes that our breathing right. get really fast and higher right right so we are taking all the heat inside of our body and afterwards when we finish it so though we are we are feeling tired and we feel a lot of energy inside which is going outside while doing this ashtanga series but mm-hmm. afterwards when we finished it we feel so relaxed it doesn't take maybe more than 2 or 3 minutes that we started to feel energized and then mm-hmm. we feel normal mm-hmm. and but so- if you do any other sp- sports you feel that uh, when you play it you need a more time to get relaxed afterwards mm. so that's a, it's a big difference it's an interesting one so depending on the the country and the culture and um, some some yogis are still practicing fire breath and others aren't now of course you're in rishikesh um, one of the, the great centers of yoga but 
Um, mm. I was curious to hear whether there'd been any any news about that there, about people that opted out of doing fire breath just because it was too intense for them and what your views are on that. Should people push through even if it is uncomfortable? See, uh, I haven't seen any Indians uh, who has been passed out while doing fire breathing. Uh, with the Western people, yes, I have seen that. It's because they are not used to of it, and uh, sometimes mm -hmm. they they passed out while while doing uh, yoga yeah. as well, because it gets uh, too intense as well. Mm -hmm. It's also because of the environment and what they're thinking, and mm -hmm. the weather condition is also totally different here in India as compared to the Western culture. Mm -hmm. Here. Uh, uh, when people come here in summers, it, it's mostly happen in summers because it's too hot and humid here in uh, in India. When people mm -hmm. come here and, and, and do yoga, it's also sometimes too difficult for us, uh, for Indians, but then uh, we, we try to mellow it down. But sometimes uh, when people try to push their limits, I'm not saying it doesn't happen with Indians. It, do, it does happen. Yeah. It can happen with, with anyone. Yeah, yeah. When they try to push their limits and then when they're fighting against the body, Yes, it will. It will give an effect, and they might pass out, and and it it might can happen with anyone. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So, is your view on on certain yoga practitioners and teachers in Japan as well as the West, who are not doing, and including Australia actually, who are not doing or excluding the fire breath from the practice altogether? What mm -hmm. What would your message to them be, or what? Do you think that's the right way to go about it? Or do you think that's a big mistake because it is an integral part of, of the Ashtanga practice? Uh, see, everyone has a different way of doing things. I would not tell them what to do what uh, and what to do uh, because there are different methods what they're using. And as I said, the environmental, uh, the weather plays a big role. The climate plays a big role in that as well. I don't know how they do things over there in, in the yoga rooms because here in India, we don't have... A, uh, you know, uh, the fire uh, system here in India, even if it's uh, winters, uh, uh, what the temperature you have outside, the temperature you have inside the rooms. We don't have heaters at home. So we do things as for that. And I don't know uh, how things are working over there. I haven't done yoga uh, outside in the West. So whether they do a Vikram yoga to make the room more uh, uh, heat up the room and then they started doing it. So I can't really comment on, on this particular topic. It's it's their personal choice, how, how they do it. Uh, obviously, people have uh, uh, modernized yoga in a very different ways. You know that now, uh, earlier it used to be just one yoga. It was only Hatha yoga and then comes uh, Ashtanga and Yanga. Now there are many forms of yoga which are coming and people are uh, traditionalizing it in their own way. So that's mm -hmm. their own way of doing things. And when people like it, it's also a good part. So everything has a bad side and the good side as well. Obviously, when people, there are people who will not like it because Indian, when you ask Indians, they will say, okay, that it should be in a traditional way. But uh, when people are doing it, at least they are doing something, it's better than uh, doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a good way of uh, looking at things when you when you try to keep yourself positive and when you try to make yourself open, then, then you started to see the good side instead of looking at the bad things. So, yeah. so I think, it's it's not a bad thing when when they are doing something uh, uh, and and then that makes the people more and more comfortable because if you if you make the person more strict uh, if you do mm -hmm. things more strict to a person then mm -hmm. this person might leave that uh, this person there it's it's a complete beginner the person who is coming right. to do yoga and then it's too much for the first day and for the first week he or she might leave the class and then he or she might not leave it again i i met many Many people, they say that, that it's yoga is too much for them. It, it's mm -hmm. because people push them really hard and then they couldn't handle it. So that also could uh, lead to some serious injuries and other things. So uh, it's, it's good when you, when you start uh, doing things slowly, you should understand your body first, that what you can do and what you right. cannot do. Right. And then afterwards, yeah. Yeah. afterwards do things. Mm. So how, how strict is it in, in some of the ashrams in terms of like, so I've, I've heard things about, I've heard stories about some of the other ashrams, like, like you can't progress in the Ashtanga practice in India unless you've, you've been able to sit in each posture for five minutes and then you're allowed to progress onto mm -hmm. the next posture. Is that, is that the standard 
is that still the standard in some ashrams or has that become a little bit more more flexible now in terms of um i don't mean physical flexibility i mean in terms of um beginner flexibility and how how flexible the teachers are how strict they are see uh, when it comes to to yoga practice in india most of the ashrams they are not into yoga they are mostly into philosophy and if they are into yoga they are into traditional yoga that is the hatha yoga mm -hmm. ashtanga which you are talking about or the other other yoga practices which you are talking about it's uh, it's the school that i would say it's the particular yoga school who are giving uh, the classes or uh, mm -hmm. uh, the teacher training courses yeah, then, then it's different yeah, yeah yes yeah. then it's okay. different and then Fair. they have their own personal mm -hmm. way of doing things and then okay uh, it's it's because they they're teaching in certain way that if other person can't do it then then their teaching is so intense the other person cannot handle the teaching so it's right. their way of uh, judging a person if they can if the person can do it then 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 only you should apply for the particular course if not mm -hmm. then it might get too intense for you and and then uh, you might not like it because once uh, that this this things also happen in yoga people started the ego started to kick in so for example when you do a certain pose and when you look at others the other person can do it and you can't do it it yeah. started to give you a negative thought sometimes and it right. happened with a lot of people because they instead of looking at themselves they are looking at others how the other person right. is doing right and they start and they start copying it yeah so coming back to the the 5 minutes thing is is that a thing where where in the stricter trainings it would be 5 I minutes i have not per heard course. it yeah i don't know about mysore i haven't been there so uh, i don't know but here in rishikesh and in other places i have not heard it because there are many beginners who are coming mm -hmm. who have no experience in yoga and it's their first yeah. time and they just do the teacher training and yes. they they do complete their teacher training and they do get their certificate so if this is the case they they should not be allowed in the first place got it got it that's good to know that's really good to know so today's conversation focus um is going mm -hmm. to be around some of the, the vedic the vedic terms um so we're going to start mm -hmm. defining defining some of these but we'll start first of all with the definition of a uh, gurukul mm -hmm. so can you tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about gurukul and what it means it's a type of school isn't it okay yeah it's it's a traditional uh name in sanskrit we call it uh, in terms of school so in in english you can call it a school and and in hindi or uh, we call it uh, uh, with hmm. uh, uh, i forgot the name uh, and then uh, in in sanskrit we call it guru mm -hmm. so it's right. the most traditional way which used to uh, which is going from from ages and ages that's how people used to study so there was a one swami or any any swami who is sitting uh, at one point at one place and then the other students are coming over there and learning uh, through the vedic culture through all this vedic terms and uh, uh, all the all the vedanta and everything which is in indian philosophy is there so that's how they used to study but it was also not allowed for everyone uh, as you know that we have a caste system in india only it was uh, uh, it was for the uh, the brahmins we called them pandit so they are only allowed to go to this gurukul school and they are allowed to study uh, uh, to be a priest or to be a swami or a monk who can get the higher knowledge and can provide this higher knowledge to to others mm -hmm. some may oppose to it and then i i also do that there are many things which i also don't like uh, uh, in into the indian culture into indian philosophy and then the caste system is one of them but yes gurukul is the is the way of teaching uh, to the students in a very basic way there was a no no uh, mm -hmm. classes which uh, which was happening uh, inside the the doors mm -hmm. it was always things are uh, happening in open so mm -hmm. the most basic one is that there were there is a one tree and the, and the mm -hmm. guru or a swami is sitting under this tree and the, all the other students are sitting in front of him and mm -hmm. the learning learning the way how all the vedas and everything which is being taught by the swami or guru so that's the the literal meaning of gurukul so guru means uh, uh, the swami or the teacher and kul means the students who are uh, who are going over there to take the advantage of the teachings from this guru and the swami mm -hmm. beautifully explained thank you so much and the next what the next question is um can you tell us a little bit about ramayana 
Mm -hmm. So uh, Ramayan and uh, so Ramayan started. It's it's on the basis of uh, uh, we we can talk about the three main characters where where it starts from. The one is Ram, and the the brother Lakshman, and the Ram got uh, married uh, to to Sita. So afterwards, what happened? There was a biggest devotee of uh, of Shiva, uh, whose name is uh, uh, whose name is Ravana. So he he saw Sita, and then he uh, he said that okay, I want to have this woman. If I can't have her, no one can have her. So he kidnapped uh, Sita, and mm -hmm. afterwards he he tried to keep her in custody uh, to make sure that mm -hmm. okay, she will not run away. And until <laughs> she say yes, he will he. Will, so he have his own principles as well. So though he has kidnapped her, he hasn't even touched her because he, until she said yes, uh, he can't do anything without uh, her own will. And uh, he was the biggest devotee of Shiva. So he has a lot of powers at that particular mm -hmm. point of time. So that was, he was right. the biggest uh, uh, Asura, we can call it, uh, uh, one of the devils, you can also call it. Uh, so he was one of the biggest devil uh, at this point of the time. And then, Ram and Ramayan went on, went on 14 years of extension. So it was given by his uh, one of his aunt because there was another brother who wants to sit on the throne, but uh, his father uh, gave the throne to Ram. Uh, when she get to know, when when the aunt get to know, she she tried to trick uh, the father, and then she said that okay, I tried to help you in the past. Now you gave me one promise that you will do anything, whatever I ask for. So she asked for the throne to to one of his uh, 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 one of his another brother that uh, Bharat, uh, Ram brother Bharat, and then he gets to sit on the throne, and then Ram and uh, Ram Sita and uh, and Lakshman gets to to go into fourteen years in in jungle, and mm -hmm. afterwards when this this incident happened when Ravana took uh, Sita. And afterwards, all the wars started to happen that Ram and Lakshman wanted to save Sita. And then they started to build their own army where the Hanuman comes in. He wants to help uh, Ram to, to get back Sita. And then this all started going on in 14 years when, when they tried to fight uh, Ravana uh, to get back Sita. And when yeah. actually, actually the war happened, mm -hmm. uh, Ram, Ram killed uh, Ramayan. There's a long story which is going on. Because if I go in detail, then it has a lot of things inside it. But yeah. the main story is Ram and Lakshman. Uh, Ram is married to Sita and Lakshman is the brother of Ram. They try to, to save Sita from, uh, from Ravana. And at the end, they, they kill Ravan. Uh, where Ravan is coming from the Sri Lanka. Where you go that uh, uh, you can also see a lot of traditions which is going on with the, uh, with the mm. Ravan. And right. uh, they, 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 they have been walking from uh, India to Ravana, uh, to, to Sri Lanka to kill Ravana and the war where the war happened. And afterwards, uh, uh, they, they get back to Sita and afterwards they came home uh, in India. And that's how uh, the Diwali culture in India comes from, from this Ramayana. Because, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the yes. festival of lights. Yes. Exactly. So people were so happy about it that they started uh, uh, lighting their whole area, their whole village, their whole town, and everywhere in India when they get to know that this thing has happened. So mm -hmm. uh, the whole India was brightened up with the lights. So that's where mm -hmm. uh, Diwali came from. Just be before Diwali, there was another festival. We call it the Shara. It's, it, it lasts almost like 10 days where there's a lot of carnivals which is happening in different parts of India where yeah. they also burn uh, uh, the statue of Ravana just to, to, to show that uh, uh, there is a, the, there's a win over uh, this devil. And then now we, can, we, uh, we are ready to go and celebrate Diwali. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so two, two, is, uh, yeah, two yeah. questions here, sorry to put you on the spot. Um, but if, for people who want to learn more about, about uh, Ramayana, where, where mm -hmm. can they read? Where, where would you direct them to? For, for people who want to learn so, more about this? So there are books, uh, when you want to learn through books, there are books related to Ramayan. And uh, obviously it might get difficult. So the best way they can do it, so there is a there's a series available. It's there, there is a Hindi series also available, which has been subtitled into different languages. Or mm -hmm. there is a cartoon series, which is also available in English or, or into different languages or subtitle where people can watch and 
uh, able to learn uh, in a in a very good way about Ramayana. So mm-hmm. because it's a it's a very long series, you can't just uh, just do that in one day. You need a long time to understand yeah. the culture, to understand the uh, the different roles of different people, and obviously it will it will really difficult for them to digest and at the sure. because how how the powers is coming in the picture because people have not really uh, used to of uh, hearing that okay this this mm. person is a, is a god and then right. this person has this kind of powers and doing these things right. so uh, i also get to hear this from other western people when when i try to tell them when they ask about shiva when they ask about other other gods and then they ask uh, do do they really have powers but it's it's similar like when they when they talk about uh, jesus or if they have any other gods in their own tradition yeah so yeah. so it's 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 their beliefs i i don't mm. say that this person mm. is uh, there is no jesus or there is no shiva sure. it's sure. our yeah. belief believe so sure. it's kind of non dogmatic yeah exactly. of course yeah exactly coming back to the question of the, the publications are there any are there any specific mm. publications that you have in mind or that you've recommended before to people and this series that you recommend mm. is it simply called the series of ramayana or are there are mm-hmm. there other um are there other spin-offs to that or what is the actual name of the series uh, the series name is ramayana as per, as the name suggests because uh, that's how people remember it and that's mm-hmm. that's how people uh, mm-hmm. uh, tell to others if they say ramayana mm-hmm. for for us in india uh, we get to te- uh, we get to learn that in school it's it's a part of a subject so mm-hmm. uh, where we get a small book uh mm-hmm. it's in the in the form of a cartoon as well so mm. people don't uh, the students don't get bored and then they get to hear the story from the teachers and afterwards we have to give exam so whether we like it or not it's it's in our head we no one has actually uh sometimes we will not, not really have studied as well mm. they just see that uh, in the form of a tv so yeah. when it comes to books mm. there is uh, there is one publication which is uh, formed by uh, kita bhavan uh wait let me just check uh, check the name of this yeah. series uh this, this publications yeah spelling would be useful mark because these spellings are very complex yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah and my my second so, question while mm-hmm. we're researching mm-hmm. that is um mm-hmm. the connection between diwali and ramayana so the birth of the diwali festival where can people find out more about that so it's the end of uh, the series where when you watch ramayan and when right. the series end that will lead to that why people mm-hmm. actually celebrate diwali okay uh, when okay. yes so the, when you when you started to come to the end when then then you started to realize when the ramayan ends why people were so happy and why they started to to uh, to light up their whole uh, houses we call it diya they they uh, they were not used to be any kind of candles we have mm-hmm. a clay pot uh, small things mm-hmm. and we call it dia and mm-hmm. then we put oil into it and then we started to burn that with the with the help of yeah. Our, uh, yeah. Any, anything yeah and so that's really it used to be very natural yeah so that's really cool so basically the conclusion of the ramayana series becomes the birth of diwali and how that festival manifests itself today because it's still something that's exactly exactly that's true right. so so the publication i was talking about here there's a very good publication it's called mm-hmm. geeta press so uh, i will spell for you so it's g i t a geeta and press p r e w s press and uh, they are from gorakhpur that's one of the uh, one of the state in india it's uh, the name is g o r a k h p u r gorakhpur so this is a publication where they produce a lot of books uh, mm-hmm. uh, or everything which is related to indian philosophy indian mythology and everything and then you can go ahead and you can uh, you can search on it and uh, you can find it easily you can find it uh, online as well and then you can find the hard, hard copy as well and the other things which i told you that you can go online you can easily find on youtube as well the series are completely free that you can watch online there's a there's a series uh, which is a old 1980s and 90s series that you can watch how you can watch it in the form of a cartoon as well mhm mhm fantastic um next let's move on to um 
Mahabharata. Can you tell us about mm -hmm. that? Okay, so uh, that's uh, so Ramayan was older, and the, then comes the Mahabharata. There's a there's a difference. So when people really ask that which is older, so Ramayan was much older, and as compared to to Mahabharata. Uh, now Mahabharata is uh, something around more than five thousand years old. I don't know the exact because when people say a lot of things, but uh, there is not particular uh, a time gap uh, for this particular Ramayana and Mahabharata. So Mahabharata is uh, is also another series where it focuses on five brothers. We call them Pandavas. So Pandavas in Sanskrit means five, and uh, the another uh, brothers which are like hundred brothers, Kauravas. So it's again. Uh, so this this series uh, focus on the empire of uh, of property that uh, that one gave this property to to the five brothers, but uh, the hundred brothers were not agreed to it, and they wanted to fight for it, and and they they take this property with the, with a trick. And mm -hmm. there was uh, one of the uncle of uh, of Kauravas. They they try to play a game, a gamble, you can call it. And then this this uncle uh, has some kind of dice. Uh, so when they were playing this game, so whenever they they throw this uncle throw the dice and it comes to to in his favor, and the Pandavas lose everything what they have just because of this uncle. And afterwards, when they get to know that it has been tricked, so they were so angry and then they wanted to get everything back. And then that's how the fight happens. And this happened in Kurukshetra, which is also which is in India. Not uh, uh, not too far away from Rishikesh, and the fight actually happened over there, and it runs for a very long time. And uh, so the five brothers killed uh, the Kauravas, Kauravas, and afterwards to gain the empire, and afterwards uh, everything went peacefully. Now mm -hmm. the biggest part of the Mahabharata is uh, uh, Arjuna. So there was uh, one main character that is Arjun. Uh, who who is also the main uh, fighter in uh, in this fighting series? Mm -hmm. Now he he didn't want it to fight because he said that I I don't really want to fight my own brothers because the hundred brothers which they are talking about it's mm -hmm. also their own brothers it's it's a it, in the form of a cousin and he said that I I don't want to kill my brothers and I just want to to go to Himalayas and uh, and uh, I just want to meditate I don't want to make anyone's wife a widow i don't want to make anyone's family uh, to lose their son because when the fight will happen he has to kill a lot of people and a lot of people will get killed so he he really didn't want it to do that and the another main character is krishna so mm -hmm. that's that's a god uh, he tried to explain him that okay it's it's your uh, duty to do these things when you have been when you have been born as uh, Kshatriya, that's another form of a caste system, which I... And how, uh, how are you spelling that before. word? How do you spell that word, Mark? Kshatriya. Kshatriya, you mean? Yes. So it starts with K, it starts with K-S-H-A-T-R-I-Y-A, Kshatriya. The K okay. is silent in that. Yeah. So his duty is is to fight and, and, and to do the rightful things. So he mm -hmm. explained Arjuna and then he said that I will become... Uh, uh, so they have the chariot and he said that I will become the chariot person for you and I will guide you in your whole journey while fighting uh, uh, through the fight. And then he tried to explain everything. He said that I will not even touch uh, my finger to anyone because if Krishna wanted that he he could win the battle just with, with one finger. But he said that I will not do anything. I will not be a part of the fight, but I will be the one who will be guiding you. He is the one who know that what will happen in the future, but he didn't state it anything. He just wanted to go uh, to let the things happening the way it should be. And mm -hmm. then he helped it. So the, the conversation mm -hmm. between Arjuna and, and Krishna, which happened during the whole fight, is, uh, is it has been written into uh, Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita, uh, which is the basic form of uh, Vedic studies, uh, which we call it also Vedanta, it's the base of it it comes from Mahabharata it's it's a small part but uh, a conversation between Arjuna and mm -hmm. Krishna where he tried to explain when Arjuna said that he he really don't want to fight they were uh, in the starting point of the fight and where, where Arjuna said that I, I really don't want to fight I really don't want to kill my brothers and when Krishna started to explain things why he should do that and what what's your really duty is 
so that's everything it has been written in the form of a uh, bhagavad gita there are different shlokas and then which has been translated into english or different languages where you can read it and uh, and then people people try to understand that that's that's the reason people there's a lot of people who follow krishna and it all started from bhagavad gita that's why people chant hari ram hari krishna and mm-hmm. then the so the ram comes from uh, uh, from uh, from ramayana and the krishna comes from uh, mahabharata and ram is another form of a krishna so that's why ram names come with krishna so first mm-hmm. is uh, ram and then krishna they are all together mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that answers my next question then that's great so the last theme we're going to explore today is uh, chanakya niti can you talk mm-hmm. about that so when we talk about chanakya niti uh, it's it's also a monk or you can say a swami who is very mm-hmm. well uh, educated and then he he took his education in in gurukul but you know that uh, the fingers are not all together there is always one who is above uh, the person so he was one of them and then he has his own brain and then uh, people can't really understand that uh, in in his childhood because his way of doing things is is way different than the other things and when he started to grow up as his, his brain also started to grow up so he used to be one of the person who has been uh, uh asked by everyone because when there is a war happening when there is a fight happening everyone is asking for his kind of strategies because it was so unique that no one can figure out that it can actually happen or not his way of thinking is is way beyond different things that's why people started to 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 apply his logics which he is being writing into vedic studies he he has been contributed himself into different different Uh, uh books and different uh, uh vedic studies that mm-hmm. his his strategies is mainly used in terms of fighting and in terms of running or uh, ruling a country or running any any kind of thing so so basically that's why niti means strategy and uh, the name of the person was chanakya so when we say chanakya niti that means chanakya strategies so if you have any kind of problems so when when you when you don't know how to do things people people just go to him and ask for his kind of strategies that what he will do when he will be in 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 the other person shoes and mm-hmm. the way he start telling things it's completely blown away the other person because his strategies mm-hmm. are way different than uh, than the other person mm-hmm. in a good so way that's the basic meaning yeah in a good way so mm-hmm. uh, for example is one thing he said that uh, uh, to become a clever person so now when we say clever uh, some person will take it in a positive way and some person some person will take it in a negative way so mm-hmm. now he doesn't say that in a negative way he said that okay so for example when you want to be clever for example if you if your life is in danger so obviously you can't just give away for, uh, your life you need to be clever in this kind of situation that doesn't mean that you have to outrule the other person or that you have to fool the other person or you have to show the other person that okay, okay i'm superior to you it means that whenever you need you need to do everything that will save your life So mm-hmm. these kind of things he has been giving to people which people were not thinking because they were too innocent to think of uh, certain things that uh, they will give away their life but he said that no your life is most important if you are alive then you can do more things but if your life is too small that you give away for any kind of small things then what's the use of this life you are no, you are no less than one um, to an ant or any kind of animal which we are killing just for for a fun so you have to be clever when it's necessary right right a bit of a wider question now so um in terms of like the epidemic and strategies talking about strategies coping strategies for the epidemic and also things that you've learned at the ashram that have helped mm-hmm. you how how has your relationship with yoga and meditation changed or what is mm-hmm. what has come to the forefront in terms of reflections um this well I say this year we're in 2021 now but over the past 12 months of this this journey mm-hmm. Okay so uh first I will start at how how I came with yoga uh and afterwards I will I will go further that how mm-hmm. these 12 months uh, is with me mm-hmm. So before like any other person I, I was living in Delhi and then the life was normal for me like working in a corporate sector and working mm. for the big firms and earning money and in india the things are that okay you should have a good job and then you start earning you are helping your parents and then 
then you have a better life and then afterwards you started to get married and then have children and then that's how the life goes on that's that's uh, pretty normal i think for the western life as well that okay that you're working that you find uh, a partner and then your life is going happily uh, but uh, my way of things are doing different though i was working but it's not what i really wanted to do but i also didn't know that what i really wanted to do mm-hmm. uh, and then i was thinking of doing something else uh, i didn't know what i really wanted to do so that was haunting me for a long time because i think a lot and afterwards i thought okay it's too much for me let's just keep it and keep on working what you're doing and after a long time uh, uh, a dream come to me i was i was sleeping and then i was walking on a straight path and then it it i just feel like i've been walking this uh, through my whole life because just because everyone is walking i have to walk with them and i started to feel strange i feel that why the hell i'm walking straight along with everyone why why can't i go right or left i just took left and and take a detour and then i started walking in a forest i start again i was walking but at least i was happy because i was just being myself i was being i was in the nature and i can just do anything i want uh, that i know i feel so happy in that dream afterwards and i wake up and i felt that i i i remember each and every second of this dream i felt that i have been left i lived an other another life in this particular dream same day i went to work and i quit my job without thinking anything else and afterwards i start looking i start chasing this dream i couldn't find any answer for months in between i also thought that uh, the decision which i took was the right decision or not so uh, i was kind of sad as well because i didn't know what i really wanted to do i have no source of income mm-hmm. and and suddenly one day i was uh, at my friend's place and then I, we were thinking and then he talked about uh, we Rishikesh and uh, and suddenly a thought of yoga came to me and the next day i packed my bag and came i came here to rishikesh i start looking for a different places where i can stay mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. how i find uh, uh, the ashrams and uh, i i get went, to speak to one swami and you never went back right after that you stayed there Ex- exactly so i i came here i started living in an ashram and uh, my life has been completely changed Yeah. So I came for uh, I came looking for just particularly yoga because I also didn't know though you people are from India but for us yoga is also what uh, what people think in in the west because not every person in India do yoga and people say that okay you are from India and then you are doing yoga that's that's not true not everyone is doing yoga in India it's like a particular person who is who get into it or or, or a particular area for example in Rishikesh mostly people do yoga but when you talk about other cities for example delhi or mumbai not every person who is doing doing yoga and they don't know much about it as well i was one of those and when i came to rishikesh i get to know more about it and then i get more into philosophy in the starting because uh, the swami uh, with whom uh, i was living with and uh, he was uh, giving lectures about vedanta when i when i when i was sitting over there i i feel so much happy when i get to hear all those things and then he talks about uh, what actually life is and he's talking about the things for other person maybe it doesn't make any sense but for me it started to feel like okay this person is talking about just for me i don't care about what he's talking about the other person but i started to feel that he's particularly talking about me when he started to to say things when he started to give example and i get more and more into it and then i thought okay yoga i'm doing i started doing yoga but it's something that okay it's a, it's a part of a life it's it's a routine but but i really more interested into it that that's uh, that becomes uh, my part of life that was philosophy because i was more interested into the knowledge that ro- what really makes me happy i i love speaking with swamis i love speaking with people mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. more deeper into it and i started to get the energy of the people mm-hmm. and then i started to get more into buddhism and mm-hmm. i get the chance to meet the dalai lama as well to take teachings from him and mm-hmm. to understand what really energy is to understand the energy of a different person when i'm uh, when i'm speaking with the person so yeah. a lot of different things happened to me and then it completely changed me and then afterwards i started to apply this philosophy into my real life to not to think about the past which has really happened or mm-hmm. not to not to think mm-hmm. about the future though it's not easy but i try to practice in my daily life mm-hmm. so these small <laughs> small things make a big change Yeah, has anything specific happened in the last 12 months in terms of your relationship with practices or has it been pretty much like the same because you're so centered in it anyway that 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 almost like it's the calm of the storm in that sense especially you've been involved in it for quite a few years now but has anything changed No that's that's 
Yeah, that's that's. I felt that what I was uh, really into it. So, for example, when I've been mm. just sitting at home in this lockdown, I co- I mm. couldn't go outside. Uh, I had to stay in Delhi at that point of time uh, during the lockdown, and there was no nature nearby me. So I felt that I've been disconnected with the nature. Uh, I was sitting at home, and I was feeling uh, I was missing this feeling of the nature. I was feeling mm. I, I was missing that okay. i've been not connected to the earth and something is uh, i i couldn't get it, uh, get the positive energy i tried to stay positive but it was not really happening i told mm-hmm. you when i said that that every day i try to think that i have to be positive today but uh, at the end of the day it was really difficult to to be positive because mm. i'm just staying at one place and not to be outside in the nature uh, something was missing in my life so mm. that was the biggest change that i felt and uh, it gives me it, it 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 also brings me positive things it makes me more patient because i was i was getting impatient during this time that mm-hmm. i really want to go outside i, I really want mm-hmm. to do that thing i really want to to go into the mountains and to be mm-hmm. a part of the nature but then i started mm-hmm. to feel that okay it's it's not what i wanted it's just what i have to be happy uh, mm-hmm. in what i have that that also teach me uh, to be happy in small small things though it was really difficult and and uh, i think i'm still struggling with it but it's it's a part of life you you, you always get to learn something new it was a difficult time for me but uh, it it's also if i think now uh, i i think that it teach me something mm-hmm. very positive that i can apply into my real life now i was patient but if i have to mm-hmm. compare right now i i am a more patient as compared to to 3 years before or 2 years before just because of this lockdown and pandemic yeah i have to agree with that it just it really teaches us that the value of patience doesn't it and also our relationship with time i think has changed not just yeah, the yeah. uncertainty of the future but our, our relationship with with time and patience i think are kind of interlinked aren't they mhm but i've also learned is to let go sometimes uh, mm-hmm. in the starting i thought that okay i have a lot of time to do a lot of things and then um, i th- i thought that okay i will do that i will do that i will do that I, i have a lot of things in the mind to pass the time but but when actually it started to happen i feel that i'm i'm not in my right mind because my mind is not positive to to get my uh, to get my head into these things and then mm-hmm. if i'm not in my right mind i can't really learn something new or i can't get some get into something so mm-hmm. i just try to do nothing so you sometimes you have to do as well you have to learn these things as well just to do nothing and to let it mm-hmm. go that's what we do in the meditation as well but at that time we are actually meditating and we are actually learning to to not to do something to let go mm-hmm. everything just to stay still and to stay there maybe 10 minutes 20 minutes half hour or one hour mm-hmm. at that time we learn that okay that nothing is important and you have to let everything go mm-hmm. but when it comes to the whole day that that was the mm. difficult part so that was yeah. the really meditation for for everyone what we are really struggling with and uh, that was the biggest challenge for me and that that gives me a lot of things not mm-hmm. not then but now if i look at look back and then i uh, i really understand that mm. so linking back to the question earlier of decisiveness as well has have the practices that you do in terms of yoga and meditation have they helped you to to remain steadfast with being decisive and being certain about trusting the present moment yes it it does help a lot uh, when it comes to yoga practices uh, uh, it does help me to stay in the present uh, i don't know about uh, others but for me when i do yoga i forget everything then it's it's just me my breathing my body and my mind there was no thoughts which is coming into my mind if i'm doing yoga then i just i'm, I'm fully mm. concentrating it into it i don't know about that whether it happens automatically or whether it's been uh, over the course of time but uh, if i think myself back i can't really think of thinking something else while doing yoga even now when i do yoga it's just uh, i have a lot of things also going inside my head uh i'm not i can't say that okay i'm a fully grown up person who can actually control the mind and who can actually control the thoughts i'm being a normal person who try to uh, to achieve uh, this thing that what everyone mm-hmm. is trying to do that in the ashram as well try to meditate and try to control the thoughts so but mm-hmm. in daily life it's difficult but uh before yoga and uh, 
I have th- thoughts, but when I started doing yoga, I feel that my mind is so clear that uh, I can I can do anything right now. But mm-hmm. uh, I, I am not thinking anything. I'm just focusing of what I'm doing right now, and then that keeps me happy. And when I'm done, mm-hmm. it's 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 a satisfaction that that I had that uh, that I think okay I'm, I'm glad that I'm here and I did something over here and I've been utilized this time into something good mm-hmm, mm-hmm. fantastic Mark so we'll, we'll wrap up today's session but I really hope we can do this again soon I've really enjoyed this conversation and I'm sure everyone yeah. who's, who's watching will enjoy it as well it's been so informative and I know that you have a lot of of, of amazing knowledge to share with everyone so we'll, we'll definitely do this again soon um, if, if you'd like to come back on yeah, yeah, definitely. It was a good time uh, with you, Gabby, and and uh, I'm glad that people really wants to learn about the Indian culture. And then you're mm-hmm. also interested about it. That's why you're doing this session. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful that I can provide this knowledge, the Indian knowledge and the Vedic culture knowledge to other people. And it 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 can help in in any way possible. That that's a good thing because when the other people is happy, that makes me happy. Yeah, that's so nice. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, I'll, I'll talk with you after this session as well. So uh, thank you very much. Do you have a final message? We've got about one minute left. Do you have a final message to add? See, uh, that's what I say to myself and I will say to other person, just stay in the present and be happy. There is <laughs> a lot of worries which which has been bothering us, but uh, just, just leave the moment what you have right now because it will not come back again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah and they always say as well this the what, what's the saying um it's impossible to step into the same the same river twice yeah exactly it's always moving it's always moving always changing uh, the flow the flow yeah. of life and yoga and, and breath and uh yeah beautiful thanks very much mark and uh we'll see you next time you've been watching the culture Thank you, Gabby. all right Bye-bye. Bye. take care see you